How we doing? That's good worship, wasn't it? Yeah, we're going to keep worshiping, all right? Through the word, all right? Yeah, yeah, let's get excited about that too. And welcome to week number five of our series called Running with the, the Giants. Man, you guys are a very smart church, all right? It's on the screen. All right. Uh, man, we're excited that you're here to hang out with us today. If you haven't been here, catch up with these on the on the website. And uh, I think it's, I've, I've had a blast in this series. I don't know about you, but man, I just digging through God's word, doing these character studies, some of the best and most fun preaching that I get to do. And so I enjoy it. Our theme verse for the series for the last five weeks has been Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, where it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that it hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let me just give you a quick little rundown of the goals that we set out when we, when we started to write this series. And the, the main goal was that we would take giants out of Hebrews chapter 11 and begin to look at where their lives and their stories were, were, were intersecting with your lives and my lives. But if you've ever played a sport, you'd understand that everybody up in the crowd is yelling and screaming instructions at you, but you can't hear anything that anybody's really saying because it's just one big muffled mess. So what we're saying is we see by this passage that these giants are able to look down out of heaven and sort of see what's happening with us when we're down here on earth. And in this process, our goal has been is that these guys, in a sense, are coming out of heaven and they're going to out of the stands and they're going to run beside you on the track that you're racing on. All right. So we're all on a track. Imagine that with me. I know you're looking at me and you're like, you haven't been on a track in a really long time. And uh, and we're we're going to and they're running our races with us. And, and the goal is, is that as they look at where their lives intersect with our lives, the other part is, is that you would leave every single week encouraged with something that when all heck breaks loose on on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, over the next six days, you'll be able to remember like, man, I remember that was going on in Jacob's life. Or I remember that little lesson that Isaiah gave me or what Elisha said, or, or man, I want to make sure I go where God's calling me because I don't want to end up in the belly of a big fish like Jonah. And uh, so that you'd be encouraged by something that you've heard, but also that you'd come to a little deeper knowledge when it comes to the scriptures. And so that's, that's been our goal. And so today we're sort of turning a corner, though, in the series. The last four weeks, we've looked at four giants who have all been men. All right? Are the men in the house today? Wow. You guys are some impressive bros. All right? Are the ladies in the house today? Guys, man, I had somebody ask me the other day. They said, like, "Man, you you're you're one of those manly churches, aren't you? Cause you're like you like you like guns and stuff." I'm like, oh yeah. Like we're a manly church. That did just not do me well right there. All right, all right. that didn't help either. All right. So then you have the men that try to overexert. Oh yeah, I'm pretty manly. You know, it's like that's the guy in the gym. All right. Anyways. Come on, men, suck it up a little bit. Are there any men that have been here for the past few weeks? And are you are there any men here today? Yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit better, but you guys still have some high-pitched voices. All right. Good luck. It's mostly out of this section right here. But anyways, uh, today we're turning a corner. And, and, and a lot of this series has been taken out of two separate books and, and studies that I've done over different times throughout my ministry uh, John Maxwell wrote a book called Running with the Giants. We'd studied that when I was a youth pastor early on in my ministry days, almost 20 years ago now. And then uh, he, he then wrote a book entitled um, The Wisdom, w- women, wisdom of the Women of the Bible. And I, I want to ask him someday, like, dude, did you like not entitle it Giant Women of the Bible for a reason? Dang, it didn't work first hour either. I thought you guys were a little, be a little more awake. Get it, giant women, that'd be offensive. You guys are hard, hard crowd today. But anyways, those are the stu- two, two books. And if you would be interested, jump into those books. Man, they're great reading and uh, great character studies of different people throughout Scripture. And that's where a lot of this is being pulled for, from. So we want to give him his due credit uh, where credit is due. But, you know, we're going to jump in and we're going to look at Mary. I mean, at the life of Mary. Mary is probably one of the most misunderstood women in, in all of the Bible. We're no stranger to her. We've just come out of Christmas. And so, matter of fact, you don't even have to know the Bible or go to church most of the time to know who Mary, the mother of Jesus, is, do you? 
I mean, she's just sort of out there. You sort of know about her. Let me, let me just sort of tell you her story. And I want you to, to sort of think about this story from the perspective of Mary. Here she is. She's a 14-year-old girl around that age, we think. And, and uh, life is good. She's just gotten engaged all right, now some of you college gals. Is there anybody in the college gal realm that has gotten engaged in the last, let's say, three months? Anybody here like that? Okay, how many of you were hoping to get engaged <laughs> and it didn't happen? Anybody like that? Just a couple guys are like, I'm in it. she'll buy the ring. I'm all in for the party, all right? Um, okay, um, how about in the last six months? Anybody getting engaged in the last six months? You don't have to be in college either. All right, year? Nobody. Wow, we are not a church that falls in love. Okay. Uh, make sure we talk to Amy about that series she's going to do here in a few weeks and uh, some others. So anyways, okay, Mary, she's gotten engaged. It's an exciting time in her life. She's 14. You know, it happened in that age range back then. And she, she's excited and she's pretty confident that She's got this guy named Joseph that's going to be able because he's got some family history and, and they're great carpenters. And so old Joe, man, he's going to be able to supply for their family. She's excited. And then all of a sudden she has in one single moment, her entire life is changed and turned upside down. This guy shows up and, and she realizes by the way he speaks that he's just not any ordinary man. And so she begins to have a dialogue with this gentleman and, and he begins to share with her and, and says, oh, hey, by the way, you're, this is my version of this story, is, is you're going to get pregnant. Matter of fact, you're going to be pregnant. And she's like, yeah, that's going to be great. When Joseph and I get married, we got a plan. We're going to have 18 kids and, and we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to have a little house and it's going to be great. And so I've got my whole life planned out and I'm going to work here and, and he's going to work there and it's going to be this great deal. Oh, no, no, Mary, you need to understand, like, you're, you're, you're pregnant now. 14 years old, she might have been a little confused by that. You know, she, she begins to, to ask some question, and, and then he goes on to say, oh, yeah, and I need you to name this baby Jesus. And also, just so you're aware, no pressure, he's the son of God. Have a great day. Catch you later. I think Mary's kind of having a God moment, don't you? Now think with me for a second. She's 14 years old, and this probably absolutely makes zero sense to her whatsoever. And matter of fact, if we were to be totally honest about this and the observations, that God's asking her to do something that's completely out of her comfort zone. Isn't it interesting that when you start to look at life. Many of us, we don't like to live out of this, outside of this little comfort zone that we have. We like to, to live in our little area of comfort, you know, and, and we like our own little life to be comfortable, and that's our comfort zone. You know, I, I'll just be honest. We, every, every single Sunday, we spend a week and multiple weeks, and our goal is, is that you can come to church and that you have this incredible time, and, and our goal is and our hope is is that you get to experience a God moment every single week when you're at the river. That's what we're trying to create. But I just, want, I, want to, I just want to help you with something. As great as worship was this morning, it was good stuff. That was great worship, man. The band, was, they were on, man. First hour, they were throwing trees back here. They were falling over. Man, I mean, they were doing some calisthenics, and, and you guys need to get, do some out there as well. But here's the other side of that, man. Is, as hard as we do at that, and as, as best we do, and the, the moments that we can create for you are absolutely nothing compared to just one second in the presence of God. One God moment like that. What Mary's experiencing right here is incredible. And Mary is taken completely out of her comfort zone. And, and when the, those happen, when these God moments happen, you don't want to miss it. If Mary, as she comes out of the stands, the thing I think she would, one of the things she would say to you right now is, don't miss your God moment. Don't miss your God moment because you, you want to stay comfortable. I, I've got great news for you today, gang. God is actively pursuing you right now. He's actively chasing you down right now. He's pursuing you, and he's wanting you to have a moment with him today. I'm here to tell you, we have prayed, and we have prayed, and we have prayed, and I have fought, and I have argued with God for the last week and a half that, that we would have a moment, but that it would look the way I wanted it to look. And obviously, first hour, it didn't look the way we had designed it, all right? God had a different plan. 
Because when God moments happen, I'm here to tell you, you don't want to miss it. For Mary, a God moment came in the form of an angel that we know as the name of Gabriel. For Moses, her, his God moment came in the form of a burning bush. And I'm here to tell you today, because we've prayed and we believe that God has spoke, there's some people in this room today, today, January 29th, 2017, you're going to have a moment with God and God is already speaking to you and knocking on your heart today. Get ready for it. Now you're like, that, that, it won't make sense. I, I, I can't comprehend that. Well, great, that's good. Because the way that God thinks is completely counterintuitive to the way that you have the ability to think. Does that make sense? You and I, we want to make sense of God. Here's what I'm just going to tell you. Somebody might need to get prepared for this. Already be thinking about this. I believe that there's people in this room that God is going to ask to get out of your comfort zone and get in that tank before this day is over. And I'm going to warn you, it's not very warm, all right? Because at 8.30 this morning, I finally gave in to God challenging me on this and said, okay, we'll do it. I don't know who you are, but I know you're here. And God is speaking to you. And he wants you just to say, you know what, it doesn't make sense. But here's, here's the great news for that is you begin to think, and you're already processing through. Some of the ladies are like, well, man, I already did my hair. And man, I'd have to straighten this thing all over again. No problem, we got that taken care of. I'd have to blow dry my hair again because I can't leave here wet because I might get a cold. No problem, we got blow dryers. We got that taken care of. I believe we do in, in the bathrooms. If we don't, Judy will blow on it for you, all right? We have clothing for you. We have shorts and t-shirts that you can change into so you don't have to get wet in your clothes anymore. We have, we've, I've thought, we've thought through this a little bit. We're as spontaneous as we possibly can for you. But, but we want to be prepared because I believe God has a moment for some others. I believe, I believe God has a moment for some people that maybe he's calling you to leave the vocation that you're presently in. And he's calling you into full-time service to, to him somewhere and at some place and at some time. And on January 29th, 2017, your moment with God of obedience is going to happen today. That's how we're praying right now. So with an open heart, I want you to, to think through what Mary said, because Mary had a God moment, and it was counterintuitive to the way she thinks, because God moments will always seem impossible to you. And this God moment that Mary's having is impossible in her mind. It doesn't make sense. She's never, this isn't rocket science. If you missed that day in the fourth grade, Mary has not had sex. And without sex, there's no baby, all right? Let me just call it as easy as we can. So if you missed the fourth grade class where they taught the birds and the bees, I just taught it to you in 10 seconds or less, all right? I hope my son was not in the room, all right? He didn't miss that day, all right? There we go. But here's what happens. When God comes knocking to get you out of your comfort zone, when God tries to have a moment with you, when God begins to challenge us, the, what instantly begins to happen, and what happens in that second is we throw the Heisman stiff arm out there, and we put it out there, and we're like, God, I'll have as much of you in my life as long as you stay right out here. Right out here, God. You can have everything out here. And we stiff arm God away because, man, it might make us uncomfortable. And it might, in our mind, just seem impossible. And that's where Mary's at. She's having a God moment. And it doesn't make sense. Luke chapter 1, it says these words, You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him, call him what? Okay, I'm going to give you a little subtle rebuke. You're going to call him what? Jesus. We need to call him that name a little more often, because that is the name of power. We want all this power in our world, but man, we have the greatest power source, and his name is Jesus. He will be great, and we're 14 years old, and you're hearing this. Imagine this. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Folks, think about what you're reading right here and what she's hearing. She's got to be like, there's no possible stinking way that's going to happen. He's the Son of God, and he's inside of me, and I've never slept with anybody. And you're going to tell me that the Savior of the world, she's a Jewish girl, the Savior of my people, is going to come from me? No way. That's impossible. And she asks the question. She even says it. She says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? See, Mary just wanted a tidbit of knowledge. She's not said yes yet. She hasn't agreed. And you know that, that part of the story, but she hasn't said yes but Mary wants a little more knowledge. She wants, she wants to try to, to come with a little more understanding. 
See, we're living in a time where our knowledge is always increasing. Matter of fact, every three years, your, your knowledge ability doubles because of the Internet. We live in, in, a, in an information age, a knowledge age, where it's just blasting at us all the time. We're being inundated with information. And what has begun to happen is that we've become completely dependent on the knowledge. We're putting all of our faith and our trust and our hope in our own personal knowledge versus putting it in our creator, the creator of the knowledge. We, we sort of bypass him. We're like, yeah, 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 it's a good idea. But we don't put any faith in him. We put all of our faith in ourselves. So where this plays out for you and I is we're trying to understand God before we can obey God. We're trying to, to make sense of God in our minds before we're ever willing to take that step of faith and that step of trust to say, okay, God, I'm, I'll follow you. I'll do what you're asking me to do. If this is how you're living out your, your life, if this is how before you make a decision, you've got to make sense and everything has to add up and everything has to be perfect. It has to be in order and it has to be crystal clear for you. I'm going to let you on to a little secret. Are you ready? You're making your God, our God, as small as you. You're putting God in a box. You're trying to understand God in your little mind, in my little mind. And God is so much greater than us. We can't, we're limiting God. You and I were not created for the mundaneness of this life. We were created for the extraordinary of this life. I believe firmly that you and I are God's instruments of impossibilities. Let me say that again. You should get excited about that, all right? We are his instruments of impossibilities. It, it brings me back to the, to the word for, my, for this year for me that I got way back in November, December, sometime in that time frame. It was the word miracles. It's in my Bible. It's, it's in there. Matter of fact, part of my life plan was to, was to start writing and and I just came up with it. I can't wait to tell you about it later, but it's going to be pretty cool when, it's, when somebody else writes it for me and makes me sound smart. But anyways, but you might hear the word miracles and you might be sitting here saying, you know what? That doesn't happen anymore, Matthew. That was great stuff in the Bible. Those are good ideas. And it makes people feel all warm and fuzzy inside on Sunday mornings. But it doesn't happen anymore. That's not legitimate. Miracles, my friends, let me just help you understand this, are happening all around the world. They're happening all around the world. We see miracles in other cultures happening all the time. And here's the only difference that I can see between those cultures and the culture of America is this. You ready? They are 100% dependent on God because that's the only, where they can, only place to go. And we're dependent on every, all of our knowledge and stuff. I want to I show you a picture and tell you this little lady's story. I met this lady when I was in Nepal uh, just about a year ago. The picture was taken just because we thought it was funny. Um, that she's three foot eight and I was six foot six. Um, you know, Babu is the is the, the guy is one of the first believers to ever give his life to Jesus in the country of Nepal. One of the first. He is like a he's a first generation Christian for not just a family, for an entire country. And this guy's like a modern day apostle Paul. Man, they go out show the Jesus film. I mean. Jim was there with me. We were in a room with him one day, and he was praying. Man, he was bringing fire down, man. I mean, it was like, I mean, it, Jim, I, you're right back there. Am I right? I mean, this dude, I'm like, do you pray for me any day? I don't even know what you're saying. But, man, we, this lady was possessed, and they're going through all this. I mean, it was intense. And we met this little lady at a restaurant one night, and her story is this. And, and uh, I, if I get it wrong, Jim will tell you the true story, all right? Uh, my understanding was her husband was sick and dying. She was, I believe, Hindu. And she had met Babu on the street, and he had told her about Jesus at some point in time and visited in the hospital. Her husband was told he has a few hours to live. She left and went home. And when she got home, she got on her knees, and she says, Jesus, this is me and my words. I'm sure this is how she said it. Jesus, if you're real, then heal my husband and I will follow you for all of eternity, and I will become a missionary for you and tell my story. She went back the next morning, no medicine. No offense to all the doctors that we have in our church. Nothing, except for the fact her husband, within five hours of her leaving and coming back, calling on the name of Jesus, 
the, the giver of every miracle. He was sitting up in his chair. He himself is now a follower of Jesus. That'd be pretty easy to accept. Miracles are still happening, my friends. Happening all over the world when people, when the only thing they can do is depend on God for their miracle. I wish this little lady's story could be all of our stories, but it's not. And that's when you just have to begin to trust in the sovereignty of God. I don't understand it, how it works all the time. But what I do know is that there's miracles happening all over the world. See, it comes down to this thought that we can't, we can't just move straight from our heart. We, we, we just can't deal in our mind all the time. We can't just stay up here and it's got to make sense to me before I make this decision. Sometimes you just got to let your heart work. And you just got to trust your heart. I mean, it's just where it's at. I, miracles happen. I found this quote this week. Miracles happen when our willingness to trust God intersects with God's plan. Our job is not always to get it up here, but it's to trust Him in here. Mark 10, 27 says, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. With man, this is impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. We must discipline ourselves to just not go to our knowledge base first. But sometimes, and the majority of times, to just trust our hearts. Because God plays in the world of impossible. Mary would also tell you, when God moments come, you should just say yes. Just say yes. Just say what? She says in verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary's got to be thinking, as I, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm saying yes. If, if you and I want God to do the impossible in our lives, we just might need to step back and, and, and not allow the, the fear to cloud our ability to see the end result of what God's trying to accomplish. You can't allow your fear to cloud who you know God to really be. You can't, that's what happens. That's when the enemy comes in and he begins to win, is when you and I allow, when he can cloud our, our picture of who God really is. All that Mary knew in this passage was this, is that God had a plan, and she could trust that because he was God in her life. See, the hope that we have in, in the promises of God and the faithfulness of God has to weigh, outweigh the doubt that we bring to the table when we question God. Do you hear me on that? The hope and of the faithfulness of the promises of God has to weigh more than the doubt that we will bring to the table. You know what? She's got all kinds of questions that she's got to bring to the table. I, she's, this is this use common sense. She's 14 years old. She's going to have to tell her mom and dad. That's going to be a moment. Well, how, how am I going to tell them? What are my parents going to think? What are my friends going to think? What is my brother going to think? I'm just assuming she had one. No, no. What? They're going to think that Joseph and I, we've been kicking boots already, and that's not true. Oh, yeah, Joseph, what about him? What's he going to think? He's going to think I'm some easy woman. He's going to think I cheated on him. Oh, man. Oh, what about that? Those picking religious, legalistic punks at the church. They're never going to believe this story. As a matter of fact, they can take me outside and throw me in the street and make a lesson out of me by stoning me. She obviously has some questions. But I don't know about you, this whole trust thing, I'll be honest with you, it's pretty hard. This whole say yes thing, when God wants to get us out of our comfort zone, that's not very easy. He had a plan for Mary, God had a plan for Mary, and He has a plan for you. You just have to say yes, because it's never too late for Jesus. Let me say that to you again. You just have to say yes to whatever God's talking to you about today in this moment he's wanting to have with you because it's never too late for him. Mark 5, 36 says, overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, 
just, just what? Jairus' daughter was thought to be dead in this passage. Because on the way to the house, Jesus was stopped because as he was walking, a woman with blood grabbed his cloak, if you know the story, and he felt the power go out from him. And he turned around and he's like, hey, you know, somebody, somebody grabbed me and, and what was that? And who was it? And the disciples were like, come on, we're in this big crowd. You know, there's all these there's thousands of people around you. Of course somebody touched you. It just happens. He goes, no, somebody grabbed me in faith. And I didn't know who it was. In the process of him stopping and finding the woman with blood, uh, Jairus' daughter dies. They're like, there's no reason to come. He's like, oh, it's a typical Jesus moment. Oh, I got this. No problem. She's just asleep. And they begin to question, like, this guy's nuts. You know the story. He shows up, walks in. He's in there for a few moments, and Jairus' daughter walks out alive and well. It doesn't make sense, but you just have to say yes, because your God moment will always open the door for God's best in your life. Your God moment will always open that door. This is that place where this second angel then appears and shows up in the story. And see, because Mary had, she gets out of, she gets out of Nazareth, man. She's, she's like, I'm out of here, man. I, and she heads off to her cousin Elizabeth's house. And here's what we find. It says, in a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women. She's talking. This is Elizabeth. And blessed is the child you will bear. Twice we see the word blessed so far. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed for the third time is she who was, has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. She believed three times. See, she left Nazareth because she was going to avoid the ridicule of the people. She ran to the hills, as a matter of fact. Can I tell you this, something this morning? There is a blessing coming on the other side of the ridicule you might face when you get out of your comfort zone and trust God. There's a blessing coming. When you and I say yes to follow God, He will always give you and I an, an opportunity. He will always give you and I an opportunity to be blessed and to be a blessing. God has a blessing waiting for us on the other side of our obedience. Just on the other side of our obedience, there's a blessing coming. Fast forward in Mary's life 30 years, and we're going to package this whole thing up and seal it up and be done for the day. Mary's Got Jesus. I've always wondered, you know, we don't see much about them at all from the age 12 to 30. You got to wonder what's going on in that house. You know what I mean? There's got to be, I mean, she's raising the Son of God. Imagine, imagine the debates that they could have had. He would always win. He's always right. Maybe there's something about my kid. Uh, she's obviously not raising this ordinary child. But what we see go down early on in the book of John, we know that there had to be some pretty amazing things happen between 12 and 30. Mary and Jesus, they're at a wedding, and this was obviously not a very good Indiana Wesleyan wedding because there was alcohol there. There was wine there. And they were, they were drinking some wine, and all the wine ran out. And all of a sudden, it was like, well, we got to do something because there's no more wine. And so Mary turns to Jesus and to the servants, and here's what she says in John 2, 5. This is what tells me that something had gone on between 12 and 30 that she knew he had some power. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. I don't know what you know about this guy, but whatever he says for you to do in the coming moments, I would probably do it because if you don't, all these wedding people who need some wine are not going to be happy and you're going to regret your decision for not doing what he says. Mary knew. See, I get it. When God gives us the moment where we can say yes, we always come up with a million reasons why we should say no. God might be talking to you about getting in that tank right now. God might be talking about you coming, go, saying, hey, I'm full-time Christian service. I'm in it. God might be talking to you about getting married. I don't know what he's talking to you about today. This God moment you're having, some guys just tweaked out. They're like, yeah, that's a good idea, Pastor. Make it a God thing. Works, fellas. There she is. All right? You come up with 100 reasons to say no. I've got all these reasons. I can't do this because of this. It doesn't make sense financially. It doesn't make sense for this. It doesn't make sense for that. 
But know this, the blessings and the reasons to say yes, most of the time are always going to be hidden in your life. You're not gonna, they're not going to put that. That's not on a billboard for you to see so easily. But they will always outnumber the reasons to say no when they happen. Mary's about to go back into the stands, and here's her final words of encouragement to us. First thing I think she would tell us is this, is if you want to experience God moments in your life, you need to stay connected to God. Stay connected to who? She was a candidate to the blessing because she was close to God. I said last week the best way to stay close to God is to do what? Worship. And Mary worshiped consistently. Maybe today some of us just need to turn off the TV, turn off the phone, turn off anything that's taking us and pulling us and pushing God out of our lives and find some things that will push God into our lives. In, in Luke 2, 16 through 19, we're not going to throw it up on the screen. You see a story. Jesus is now, now had, or Mary's had Jesus, and they hurry off, the, the people hurry off to find Joseph and Mary. And it says in this passage that uh, they were amazed, but it says, Mary treasured up all these things, and pondered them in her heart. See, everyone else had come shouting and praising and doing their thing. But Mary, she chose to worship and to begin to treasure up these moments with Jesus. These extraordinary moments. These God moments that she got to have, probably weekly with God. I mean, she's with Jesus. When you have the opportunity to get close to God, and when you get there in that moment, you're having that God moment, I want to encourage you to just ponder there for a little while and treasure it. I think she would tell you to stay connected to your purpose. Stay connected to your what? From the moment the angel showed up, Mary knew that she had a purpose on this earth. And the purpose was this. She was to bear, raise, and nurture the Son of God. Just a small job. Not a very big job. Just a, the Savior of the world. You got him covered. Make sure he doesn't break a leg. The people would still all know, though, when they walk through the market, nobody really believes Mary that Jesus is really the Son of God. If they would have believed that, guess what? Think about it. When he turns 30 and starts doing all these miracles, it would simply have been an expectation of what, he was, what was to come. But they didn't believe. So they would have still murmured as they walked through the Walmart and, in Nazareth. I mean, they're like, oh, there she is. <laughs> she thinks we got it all tricked out. We, it's all over social media. I mean, we... There's a whole meme about her. She thinks that she doesn't even know it. She got off Facebook because she got tired of people talking about her. Think about this. Mary would have still heard the whispers. But she knew what she was supposed to do. She knew her purpose. Because in Luke 2, 34 through 35, it says, Then Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined. You talk about a child dedication service, man. I mean, <laughs> this guy stands up and looks at Mary and Joseph and says, Hey, by the way, this child that you're holding is destined. Just so you understand, this child is no ordinary child. This is just no ordinary life. And guess what? When you and I are living with God's purpose, because Simeon was, was declaring the purpose that God would, that Jesus would have someday, when you and I are living with God's purpose in our life and it's pouring out of us, we're not going to be living an ordinary life either. You were not created to be an ordinary person. You're just not some boring, mundane, ordinary life. No one's life in this room will ever make sense, though, until you come to a place and understand the purpose that God has for your life. If you're living outside the, 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 this zone and keeping God outside of it, and you're like, my life doesn't make sense, well, let God into your, your comfort zone, remove your comfort zone, remove the stiff arm, and watch God show up in ways like you never thought he ever could show up in your life, ever. 2 Timothy 1.6 says, This is why I remind you to fan in the flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. What is Paul saying to Timothy is this. You, you, you find out your purpose. You find out who God is in your life. You understand what you were created to do and who you were created to be. And fan that bad boy and fan those flames so you just explode and ignite for God. If you know the gifts you have, then fan them. If you don't, then talk to us. We want to help you find them. We want to help you discover your purpose. We have people that can help you do that. And even today, right there in your seat, right now, ask God, ask him right now, God, could you reveal to me what it is you want me to do? So stay connected to your purpose and stay connected to people who encourage you. She, she left, she got out of Dodge, man. She was like, I'm out of Nazareth. And for three months, she lived with Elizabeth, who was able to encourage her. Find people to do life with you. Find people that can do life with you who can encourage you in what God is challenging you to do and calling you to do. Don't, don't, don't hang out with a bunch of dream squashers. 
Find out with, hang out with some people who will say, you know what? We do serve a God who's, who plays in the, in, in the impossible. And God can do this. If he's brought you to this, and this is what he's called you to do, then gosh darn it, God can make it happen. Find those people. And finally, I want to read this passage to you in John 19. And then we're going to be done. And I'm not going to fill in the blanks for you. That's going to annoy some of you right now. It's going to be fun for a few minutes because you're going to have to wonder. So John 19, it says, While the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene stood, Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. It's Mary's small group. It's Mary's dream, dream encouragers. It's Mary's group of people who walked beside her when everybody else said what she was doing was impossible. It didn't make sense. These are those who understood. And they find themselves now at the foot of a cross. And Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved, John, standing near her. He said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then the disciple, here is your mother. From that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Here's Mary's final moment that we see in Scripture, one of them. She's at the foot of the cross. And for just a moment, I, I, want, you to, I want you to put yourself in her shoes. I want you to think about what the last 33 years of Jesus' life. Mary is now, let's just say, she's about she's 47, 48. I want you to think about that. She's standing here and she's, she's looking up on this cross, this cross through the heat of the day. And she can't even make out the face of the man who hangs on this tree. Scriptures tell us he was beaten beyond recognition. Oh, but she knows because she's a mother. She knows that that's the, that's the face and the hands that used to rub her face. They're now spread out for all the world to see. She knows that that's the face of a son that she used to hold and kiss. She knows that that's her child. And Mary has to be thinking, when God came in the form of Gabriel and called me to this, He never mentioned that. He never ever mentioned that this was the end game. This is how this is going to end? This is getting me out of my comfort zone? I said yes to everything, God, and this is how you're going to end this? My son, beaten and mutilated beyond recognition, being spit upon and jeered and stabbed and punched and mocked, this isn't the end game that I thought would come. And there, she, there he hangs. Mary knew him like no one else knew him. She's got to be asking herself those questions. This can't be how it ends. There's no way for her to know throughout his entire life what the end game would be. That he was preparing this entire 33 years to give himself up for the sins of the world. And there she stood with her small group. There she stood with her encouragers. And as we've seen in the scripture, next to her was John. We know that Jesus makes seven statements while hanging on the cross. And he took one of those seven statements and directed it to his mother. And what he was saying in this very moment in time was this is I've got something greater to do than what I'm, I've been doing. And so what I need you to do, Mom, is this. I need you to stay connected to the bigger picture. I filled your blank in for you. I need you to stay connected to the bigger picture here. He tells her, I've got something greater to do. 
The only possible way that Mary can survive this moment, the only way that she can even begin to make sense of this is to understand that there's something greater and that she sees the big picture as, as Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. But as she sat there and she watched her son die on this tree, she was taken back to that very place where Gabriel took her way over here. She was back to a place where she began, where it all began that she had to rely and trust on God and put her faith in him and in the bigger picture, even though it doesn't make sense up here. Don't forget this thought, my friends. We are not meant for this earth. We are simply meant to live here, to bring about change, and then go there. We are not meant for this earth. We are not meant to live in the land of the dying. We were were created to live in the land of the living. I know this morning that God has a moment for some of you. And that moment is right now. It's right now. Our time is gone. I get it. I've preached longer than I was supposed to. But I think there's somebody, at least one, maybe two, ten, fifteen, hundred, I don't care, in this room that God's challenging you and saying your moment just might be to stay to everybody in this room and to the entire world you know what? I am sold out for, for Jesus. I am sold out for the Lord. And I'm, and I'm, going, I'm going deep and I'm plunging in or whatever those t-shirts say on them because I want everybody to know that I had a God moment on January 29, 2017 and it was a day I declared to everybody exactly that. I also believe there's some in this room that God is challenging you to say yes to a complete life change, maybe even in your vocation. I believe that God is challenging some of you, somebody. And this is a risky move as a pastor, just so you know. He's calling some of you to leave what you thought was going to be your job, and he's calling you into full-time Christian ministry. We don't talk about that very much around here, and I don't push that unless you come to me. But I believe that I was supposed to say that today because you're having a God moment and you just need somebody to spur you on and encourage you to just say yes. There could be a multiple other things that God is speaking to you about today, and you want an opportunity to have that moment with God. We're going to, Noel and Becker are going to sing and lead us and with every head bowed, every eye closed and I'm the only one, I'm actually going to have um, John and Patty Bray, if you guys can help me by looking around as well. We're going to make some sense of some things today because I think God's speaking to some people in this room. If you're here today and you say, you know what, that's me, man, I need to, I need to get in that tank and I need to declare to the entire world that I'm going deep I'm going down and today I, I don't it doesn't make sense, but I'm gonna do it. Didn't come prepared for that, but we we did come prepared for you. Just by slipping your hand up, you'd just say, Man, I, that's that's me today. Three or four in the first hour. Is anybody yeah, just keep your hands up if you can, because we need to begin to make sense of this. If you put up Actually, if you, you're going to stand up anyway, so just go ahead and stand up right now for me. If you raise your hand, there are four or five of you, I think. One, two, three, three, four. So here's what, if you're standing, I'm the, oh, I'm, uh, nobody look around, it's just me. I want to talk to you guys a second. Judy's going to meet you right here. Um, John and Patty, if you can help me as well, they'll give you, Judy can give everybody instructions and she'll get you some shorts and some t-shirts and some clothing. She'll help you out and they'll help you. So if you guys understand, want to slip right there in front of me. Um, that would be great. We're going to celebrate and party with you in a few minutes. If you didn't stand up, raise your hand right there. It's okay. You can still do that. 
In the coming moments, we'll help you out. We'll get you all set up and straightened out and get you the directions that you need. And uh, we'll celebrate that. Maybe you're here today and you say, you know what, Matthew, I think God's challenging me in some other areas of my life. And maybe it could be that I'm, God's called me to something greater than what I'm doing right now. He's calling me to this thing called ministry. And I, don't know, I can't make sense of it right now, but I need you to pray for me. If that's you, I'm the only one looking around. You just slip your hand up right where you're at. Yeah, if you can keep those up. Anybody else? Yeah, right here. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it makes my day. Myself and, and John, we're going to be around here at the end of service. If you don't know John, he's, he's a chaplain in the Wesleyan. Great guy. Um, we'll be hanging around the chat. If God's speaking to you in any other way, Noel and Beck are going to sing. We don't have an altar. We don't have anything fancy like that. But if you want to come forward and you want to pray, and if you raise your hand for any of that stuff, you want to pray and say, God, I need you in my life. I need, you to, I need this moment to be more than what it presently is. We're going to just worship and give you that freedom in the next few minutes. And then we're going to get these guys ready to baptize them. If you still are like, man, that's me. I need to get in that tank. I need to go deep. I, do, I can't make sense of all this. But man, I just feel like God is speaking to me and I need to do that. Then you head over that way by the tank. Miss Judy will get you taken care of and get you instructions. And we'll have a good party here in a few minutes. So, no. After I pray, I want you to lead us. Lord, I pray right now that your spirit would continue to move and that, God, that there would be a moment that only you can have and that your spirit is, is unifying and uniting with those in this room. And that, God, that even though it doesn't make sense in some of our hearts, some of us in the room right now, you're pounding on us. You're pounding on us. You're pounding on us right now, God. And what we thought was a dream and what we thought was what we were destined is going to be different. And God, I pray that you would just help them to say yes and be obedient today. Help them, Jesus.